Birkin in Women in Love says, look at the millions of people who repeat every minute that love is the greatest and charity is the greatest and see what they are doing all the time. Thomas Hardy, a little poem, Christmas 1924, peace upon earth was said, we sing it and pay a million priests to bring it. After 2,000 years of mass, we've got as far as poison gas. Lawrence died in 1930, that is to say before Hitler, before the Gulag, before before the Gulags, before the Holocaust, before Pol Pot, before Rwanda. Humanity clearly has an awful lot of catching up if it's ever actually to live in the consciousness of what it has done and the continuous, pretty well continuous and constant disparity between asserted ideals, Christian ideals, humanist ideals and what humanity actually daily does. Humanity... I'll just read you this paragraph from the horse dealer's daughter. Um, the family, it says the crisis has happened, the family is, is bankrupt and the men are going to move and they wonder what the girl will do, not terribly what their sister will do. Um, and the doctor, who is the sort of associate of the family, is passing along the road, there's a dip, and in the dip there's a <coughs> pond. And this is, this is the, I'm combining two things here. This is the image that causes it, and this is the way of writing about that image. Below Old Meadow, in the green, shallow, sodden hollow of fields, lay a square, deep pond. Roving across the landscape, the doctor's quick eye detected a figure in black passing through the gate of the field, down towards the pond. He looks again. It would be Mabel Purvin. His mind suddenly became alive and attentive. Suddenly... This is a moment of crisis and he focuses. Why was she going down there? He pulled up on the path of the slope above and stood staring. He could just make sure of the small black figure moving in the hollow of the falling day, sorry, failing day. He seemed to see her in the midst of such obscurity that he was like a clairvoyant, seeing rather with the mind's eye than with ordinary sight. Yet he could see her positively enough whilst he kept his eye attentive. He felt, if he looked away from her, in the thick, ugly, falling dusk, he would lose her altogether. He followed her minutely as she moved, direct and intent, like something transmitted rather than stirring involuntary activity, straight down the field towards the pond. There she stood on the bank for a moment. She never raised her head, then she waded slowly into the water. He stood motionless as the small, black figure walked slowly and deliberately towards the centre of the pond, very slowly, gradually moving deeper into the motionless water, and still moving forward as the water got up to her breast. Then he could see her no more in the dusk of the dead afternoon. There, he exclaimed, would you believe it? The kind of writing that Lawrence does leads everything in flux. There is never, hated word, any such thing as closure in a Lawrence story or any sort of fiction, because closure is not what happens in life, ever, ever, ever. So it's always of the moment and fleeting, raw and unfinished. Um, this is a point where the, um, what he said about his poetry, or about the kind of poetry he wanted to write, applies absolutely to all of his writing. An important essay called... Uh, Poetry of the Present, 1918. He's talked about the hard gems of poetry, the fashioned sonnets, the kind of Parnassian sort of poetry which she likes, but then he says, but there is another kind of poetry, the poetry of that which is at hand, the immediate present. In the immediate present there is no perfection, no consummation, nothing finished. The strands are all flying, quivering, intermingling into the web. The waters are shaking the moon. There is no round, consummate moon on the face of running water, nor on the face of the unfinished tide. There is poetry of this immediate present, instant poetry, as well as poetry of the infinite past and the infinite future. The seething poetry of the incarnate now is supreme. And that's the way he writes. That's what the sentences are actually like, fleeting. In his short, in his uh, poems, particularly, you see that. I have not time to read them. You see him again and again and again, as it were, this additive, cumulative, 
repetitive coming again and again and again at a subject which is effectively, it might be a hummingbird, it might be a snake, it might be a kangaroo, it might be a mosquito, again and again and again, a meddler, meddler tree, saw buckles, trying to get closer. It's not the case that everything that Lawrence's stories bring home to you in that substantial fashion is a death, by no means. It's quite often the case that a death is the initiation of a new life, just as Lawrence even hoped that the First World War would be. But what I like about the writing is the image itself, this real, this is not allegory, this is not symbol, this is fact. This is fact which is also a metaphor. The fact of the death is brought into the house, that thing there then is an irreducible metaphor of the whole nexus between husband and wife, which has been unhappy, and the way her life after this will either finish or, as it looks towards the end, will open into something else. Now, I'll stop there. There's loads more to say, but those, that is how it works, if you like. You can see it again and again and again. He has an eye for very proximate details, and it may be that in the life of those times they were actually closer, more readily to hand, but it is, I think, still the business of writers actually to, to look for things which will serve in that fashion. Thank you.